Hello, welcome to the UGC EPG Partshala program in linguistics. I am Professor Anvita Abbi. This is week 5 and uh, we are going to discuss two modules in, in this week, module number 7 and module number 8. We are discussing uh, language families and field methods course and we have already talked about in the first six modules, modules about the language families of South Asia as well as of India. Now we come to the second part of this course which is known as field linguistics. Module 7, in this module we will discuss about field methods, the basics of the field methods which I have termed as getting started. We are going to study why we do field linguistics. We are also going to study why field linguistics, how it is related to other branches of linguistics, how it is a feeder course to the other branches of linguistics that is. What is the object of study and how the object of study is taken into consideration and how one has to be theory neutral in uh, considering the language, in analyzing the language structures. What is the basic linguistic theory which is popularly known as BLT. In addition to this, we will also talk about some pra practical matters like what kind of equipment you should need to take into the field and what, what kind of lexicon or the word list that you should be prepared with like basic word list and the extended basic word list or basic sentence list and so on and so forth. And then we will discuss about methods of elicitation that means methods of eliciting linguistic data and then we will conclude about it. So, the course is packed uh, very neatly but also very intensively and I hope that you, you like what we teach here. The question is generally asked what is field linguistics? This is a branch of linguistics which introduces students the methodology of elicitation, transcription, organization, analysis and describing the linguistic data of the language for which no first-hand knowledge is available to students. The emphasis is to explore the characteristic features of the language on the basis of the first-hand knowledge or the first-hand collected data and to determine how different it is from the standard languages that you know of uh, being written about and uh, how different it is, uh, how di not different it is, that what are the similarities also with the other languages. How this is achieved? This is achieved by the set of questionnaires to begin with and then by analyzing oral text. So the oral text as well as the structured questionnaire or questionnaires is the, are the two various, two different, two interrelated tools that we use to elicit our data on language that we want to study. If the university allows, then I would recommend one should also visit the speech community, stay with them at least minimum of 15 days to 20 days to get to know how the language is used really and what are the structures because no structured questionnaire and just an oral text of short stories or narrations will not give you the true picture of the language unless you stay, spend some time with the speech community. Hence, this course is aimed to prepare students or to train students to prepare small grammatical sketch or sketches of the languages and interactive dictionary. So why we do field linguistics? There are many reasons for doing it. One is to, we, we would like to capture the losing linguistic diversity across the globe. And this we can do by studying the new languages and finding out about the diverse languages. Second is to document various aspects of language, not only grammar, but also the indigenous knowledge system. As you know that languages encapsulate not only the way language is used, but also many other information about the environment, about the culture, about the heritage, about the human migration. So the knowledge system that is encapsulated in language also has to be tapped at and for that we must uh, do field linguistics to reach that, arrive at that goal. The inductive method that is employed in field linguistics help us to understand why and how languages differ from each other and how some may not fall in the prototypical 
theoretical framework because there are languages which cannot be analyzed in a particular theoretical framework because they are constituted very differently. So the inductive method is used to, to find out why. Field linguistics is also used to explore and discover what has not been explored yet. And every language has a unique lexicon, as you know, a specified meaning with, which is appropriate to the society that has that language in use has been using. So it, it exposes us the real life science. I always say that field linguistics actually introduces you to the real life science language and it's all its manifestation situated in the real world from language genesis to language change to language uh, use. So this is a complete a holistic uh, course which introduces you to the language from its beginning to the end. Connects us to the origin of the language, its historical development, showing the contact, showing light on the contact between communities because we would find out which features are not uh, original to the language and which are borrowed. It also gives light, uh, throws light on social and cultural information because language structures contains these information and the hierarchical organization of the society motivates the language to uh, somehow depict these kind of constructions. So on the vertical and horizontal axis of the stratification of the society, the language uh, gives the structures which give us the information about this. Since most of the languages are unwritten in our country, oral tradition that is encapsulated, that is encapsulated in language, informs us of various myths, traditions, cultural beliefs and above all, various genres of oral literature that has to be also investigated by field uh, by the linguists who can be trained in field linguistics. Hence, it is a data-driven research and very scientific in nature because we, we do not speak in the air, we collect our data, analyze the data and then we come to certain conclusion. Today, we stand much more informed about tribal and lesser known languages of the country and not of our country but across the globe because many linguists have engaged in themselves in conducting field work. On your slide, you will show that how the field linguistics is a feeder or uh, contributes to other disciplines of linguistics in a very meaningful way, maybe it's a theory of grammar because when you come to a new language, new structures, you are, you are motivated to think anew about the theory of grammars or individual grammars and how it also you know, gives rise to some refreshed thinking towards language universals and language typology and also language in society or social linguistics. So these are the various aspects that one thinks of. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the linguistic theory have been found sometimes insufficient to describe the languages that have been identified by field linguists there have also been challenges to language universals uh, because the languages have not found uh, to be following the language universal paradigm. For example, Piraha is a language which the linguists challenge that there are no language, the language defies some of the language universals. So these are various aspects that one can find challenging and does find challenged when working on a new and unexplored languages. The question is, how does field linguistics add to our existing knowledge? And I would say that the addition comes uh, to the field because the new data uh, in a particular language refines our existing grammars and large database uh, obtained in field linguistics actually improves our stock of knowledge. So the sameness and differences in languages is very much uh, clearer by exploring more and more languages. Expo the exposure to new languages also gives us new paradigms about uh, in social linguistics that who speaks what in what context and why. So this brings us to the question of the object of study. So object of study in field linguistics is the living language as a socio-semantic system, as a means of communication, as a means of identity marker, as well as means of psychological behavior. This is very important to know. This is the object of our study, the living language. You know, language is a living organism and that should be studied in its life form. The way it is used in the society 
with its variation and nuances. So variations are very important because they tell us a lot about the community and its settlement. The other aspect that we emphasize about uh, in field linguistics is that we have to approach, uh, we have to take an approach of theory neutrality. That's because we don't want to be bound by a particular theory and its axioms and, uh, and study only those aspects which are reflected only through the theory. It should be theory dependency more often binds us than, uh, you know, uh, and restricts our vision. So generally we don't advocate that. Theory should emerge in the field, I would say, because while working on new languages and unexplored languages, you, should, you can see that a new kind of theory is emerging. Many times the new theory doesn't emerge, you have to follow the same theory. Similarly, dependency on a particular grammar, a kind of grammar should be avoided. In the past, Latin and Sanskrit grammars have been a forte or have been a body of reference for writing any language, whether it's a Tibeto Burman language grammar or a Stai Kadai language grammar, which is not uh, very fruitful because the Sanskrit grammars and were very, uh, the grammars written in Sanskrit are very appropriate for the language it is describing. Latin grammars are very appropriate for the language describing. However, because the grammars are so well written, does not mean that other languages will fit the bill. For example, I'll just give you a small example. For example, the, the duplication of a word may indicate aspect, which is attested in Tibeto Burman language, which is not available in any of these languages. They will not explain how duplication of word may indicate an aspect. Hmm? Similarly, the V2 phenomena that we just saw in aerial features, the explicated compound were non-existent in Sanskrit and they were they evolved much after Sanskrit. So the, the grammars are devoid of that. So when, I read, when a modern Indian language will be written on the basis of the Sanskrit grammar, it will completely give away or it completely forget about the uh, description of the ECVs. Similarly, the, the dichotomy that we have exposed in Munda and Tibeto Burman languages of word and sentence or between noun and verb. Hmm? There is no dichotomy between noun and verb in written Lebanese, there is no dichotomy, strict dichotomy in noun and verb in the uh, Santhali or in Munda languages elements. And this brings me to the notion of BLT or the basic linguistic theory. The basic linguistic theory was proposed by Dixon and uh, it has been tried out on several languages and been very successful on it. Successful uh, results have been achieved. The theory of linguistics uh, as a natural science, this is what he says, that basic linguistic theory is of linguistics as a, as a natural science consists in study and comparison of the grammatical patterns of individual languages. Base, the, what is important is that the BLT is based on the cumulative knowledge and insights of descriptive linguists and any new description of previously unanalyzed language could potentially modify the theory. So the theory is very flexible. One could modify the theory if you find some new features, but it is based on the cumulative knowledge and the insights of descriptive linguists of various languages that have been described. So the what we are proposing that uh, languages should be analyzed in their own terms. Investigators should possess knowledge of grammatical categories, as I said, and their operation, but uh, his vision should not be marred or blinded by one particular linguistic theory. Now coming to the more practical aspects which is given on your slides, you can refer to. We have referred which kind of tape recorders, which kind of uh, cameras, and which kind of zoom and video camera you should buy, or which kind of laptop that you will require for conducting the fieldwork and that can be checked from there. Similarly, uh, now there's another uh, tool that I talked about, I'm calling it a tool though it's uh, in the written text, is the basic word list. In 1956, Sarah Guchinsky made a basic word list to, to start any field work in any language or any unknown language, the very first hand, to get a very first hand knowledge. This basic word list is also called 250 or 200 word basic word list. However, there are little less than 200 basic words. The list has become the sole reference point by linguists across the globe to start the fieldwork. So I would request that you should also start your fieldwork by referring to this basic word list. 
and this basic word list has already been given to you in the module 7 which you can refer to. Now why the basic word list or BWL is important for us is because number one there are uh, equal number of nouns and verbs and adjectives in the list. Number two the, it gives information about the ecology of the or the location for example land, jungle, mountain those words pertaining to the ecology are there and the most important aspect is that the words given in the basic word list are those which have been identified as those which resist any changes over time. In other words it has been considered that these words will not will remain the same even when you are trying to collect words for historical uh, purpose or for the asynchronic purpose. So the words, the, these are the kind of words which will not change. For example, the verb for die or live in the verb paradigm or the word for tree or uh, the word for boy and girl in the nominal paradigm will not change, it has been believed, over the period of time irrespective of the fact how much contact the language comes into with another language family language. Hence, they resist to change through time and through space and thus it is used as a hypothesis of various kinds as well as to establish the old forms because there are many new forms of words that you may come across but in the basic word list you may uh, come across only the old type of or old forms of words. So hence, the basic word list is very essential. The other aspect of basic word list is that it has given, because it's prepared in English, it has given uh, some words which are prepositions and I would request that please avoid collecting these prepositions uh, like at and in and on and things because and there are some other words which I have listed in your module should be avoided. What in addition to the BWL basic word list I have also given a basic word list for Indian languages and you may consult Abhi 2001 page 246 by the name of 300 basic word list. This list is noun heavy as many Indian languages do not distinguish between noun and verb as we just saw and uh, the verbs can be easily derived from nouns by various strategies that also we saw how did various languages derive verbs. So this is a noun heavy word list however it is basically referring to the Indian context. So you will find words very familiar and easy to elicit. Basic word list of Sarah Guchinsky and basic word list of Abhi 2001 can be and should be supplemented by the new and additional words that you find it very useful which are uh, pertaining to the location that you are working on or the context that you are working on. For example, uh, I mean, if you are working in, a, in, a, in the speech community which is living in the jungle, you can ha add some words uh, pertaining to various kinds of grass and clay or various kinds of leaves or trunk or consider the, uh, their, their way of life. And if you are studying uh, eliciting data in the kitchen of a particular person, then you can elicit and add some words which are uh, very commonly used by the household. So this is, uh, this is very essential that you keep adding, modifying the words but basic word list of the 300 basic word list should be elicited as uh, soon as possible. The other list that you will be needing to do your preliminary study will be the basic sentence list. However, there is nothing like basic sentences but the basic sentence list has been prepared again uh, by AP 2001. Uh, and it is given in Abhi 2000 when there are only 160 sentences, they are not very many. However, these sentences are so evolved or so selected that they refer to the Indian typology or the typology of the Indian languages so that the, 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 uh, the constructions that we talked about as India in India as a linguistic area are not missed out and they have been incorporated in these basic sentences. So if you begin with these basic sentences, at the end of it you will get a brief grammatical sketch and you will also be able to identify the typology of the new language that you are studying. So the, this is very important that the basic word list of two kinds and the basic sentence list of 160 sentences and the equipment that I talked about are the basic tools that you should begin your field methods of field 
linguistics elicitation. After the tools, let me talk about the various elicitation methods, methods of elicitation that you will be using while in the field. One is the observation method and as the name says, you just observe and this comes very handy when you are working on a monolingual situation. One of my research scholars who worked on Java used this method because Java were not bilinguals and he was not, he was new to the Java community. So observation method also helps you write the grammar. Then the interview method, which is the most important, the most important method in which we are going to talk about in detail shortly, is the second method that one has to adopt while eliciting data. The third is the sending the questionnaire method. This is generally done by this linguist sitting abroad or somewhere else. It's a long distance elicitation. When you prepare a questionnaire and send to the consultants or informants, these are the two words we use for the same person, consultant or informant. Uh, but the, this uh, involves or this presupposes that your informants are educated and literate so they can, uh, uh, they can uh, answer your questions. The other uh, elicitation method is the document resource method. That is the available documents available whether online or in library, you can collect your elicit your data when you're working on a language. Generally, we adopt this method when we are working on an extinct language, the language which is no longer spoken but has some documentation available. The other method, and you have already have the equipment for it, you can video the unstructured events. That is, you just go to the community and just start videoing, uh, taking the video uh, of the community, then come back in your studio or in your room and you start analyzing what they were speaking, how they were speaking, to whom they were speaking, and so on and so forth. Similarly, you can do audio recording of unstructured events, and uh, the, you can also do the combination of both. But the thing is that uh, when we do the combination of the both, of the unstructured events, we don't get very satisfying results. As we will see, the unstructured, the, the elicitation, uh, since you are not doing elicitation uh, which is structured or which is programmable, you are doing an unstructured one. It is very difficult to analyze languages and there is generally the problem of overlapping communication or conversation. Whether it's an audio or a video, the no person speaks uh, and the other person starts where he leaves the conversation. Generally, we speak whenever we do a dog talk in conversation, there's overlapping. So overlapping of audio and overlapping of video creates problems and hence, we generally avoid unstructured events. We generally elicit our data or we generally use this method of audio and video recording of unstructured events only in the case of uh, when we are not yet accustomed to the community or the community is not accustomed to us. So we would like, we generally use this method in the very, very beginning stage of our field linguistics or field methods, which let's say the first week or the first two days, when you're just recording for the sake of determining, you know, that what kind of questions you should come prepared with the next day. So these are the methods of field elicitation. But as I said that uh, out of all this, uh, field uh, out of all this interview method is the best and that is what we are going to talk about in the next module about the interview method is employed and what we should do what we should not do to conclude uh, in this uh, module we talked about that field linguistics is a very significant and important branch of linguistics this is the only uh, branch which apprises you and trains you to acquire the first hand knowledge about those languages which were either not studied before or less studied and you can also use these uh, field methods or field linguistics to confirm the analysis of those which have already been studied. So both for unexplored, unexplored languages as well as for the explored languages, the, you can use this method to understand the phenomena. The secondly, we also uh, in this module uh, apprised you of what is the basic linguistic theory and the so that you are not trapped in one particular kind of grammar pattern or a one particular kind of theory. However, this does not preclude, as I repeat, and I must emphasize a thorough knowledge of linguistics and linguistic theory. You must know what are the uh, phonological and morphological and syntactic aspects that a linguistic theory propagates. We also talked about the very important, uh, uh, though very practical, about what kind of tools you should 
be equipped with before you move to the field including the physical things like tape recorders and video recorders and laptops but in addition to that the basic uh, word list that you should be equipped with both the one which is used universally as well as the one which we use for the indian languages let me apprise you the basic word list for indian languages have been applied to all seven language families of india with great success so basic word list uh, and basic sentence list has also been applied to all the seven language families for eliciting data with great success so it should be used in the preliminary course and this is just a basic sentence list on which we have to build on other uh, constructions so this is just a clue to give you an idea of what to elicit we also suggested several methods of elicitation of data in this module however as i said and i emphasize again interview direct interview method is the best and that's what we are going to talk about in the next module